Tabernacle, good morning, good morning. morning. Maybe I'm just talking to myself. I said, Good morning, good morning. morning. Please, can we all rise to our feet? It's lovely to see you all this wonderful Sunday morning. Please turn to your neighbor, welcome them, welcome them, welcome them online. We welcome you, we welcome you. 
If it's your first day here, if it's your hundredth day here, you're still welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. How many people are happy to be in the house of the Lord today? I said, how many people are happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Absolutely. Okay, let's set the tone today. Let's, let's start with a prayer. If we could all just bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us today. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercies, journeys, mercies. We thank you for the week that we've had. And we thank you in advance for the week that we will have. We just want to give you the glory, the honor, the praise as we worship you this morning. Receive our worship as we praise you this morning. Receive our praise. And the church says, Amen. Amen. Okay, I need you guys to get busy. Second service has always got more energy. And upstairs, when Insignia come on the stage, I need everyone to make a shout. Insignia, let's go. <laughs> Good morning. Like this. Just hear the congregation sing that. You Lord, you Lord, get the glory, get the glory, get the glory. Sing.
triumphant king so we give you all the glory lord you reign our triumphant king so we give you all the glory lord you reign our triumphant king so we give you all the glory yeah lord you reign a triumphant king, so we give you all the glory. Oh, 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 Give him the glory. Lift your hands and give him the glory. Give him thanks. He alone is worthy to be lifted high. He alone is worthy to be praised. He alone can take a sacrifice of praise. In the name of Jesus, just lift your hands and say, God, you are worthy. God, we lift you up in this place. We lift you up and we magnify your holy name. For there's no other God than your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. 
let me hear you sing, all be lifted. Above all other gods, we lay and worship you. Mm, sing it. Sing again. Oh, be lifted above all other gods. We lay and worship you. Sing, oh, be lifted above all other gods. Worship you, oh, be lifted above all other gods. Hey, we lay down our crowns before you and worship you. Oh, be lifted above all other gods. Take it up.
lay our crowns and we worship you and worship you we lay our crowns we lay down our crowns yeah and worship one more time you. we lay our crowns as the angels by us we lay it down as the elders cry holy we lay it down we lay up and worship just be still in this moment right now let's just take in the atmosphere Just close your eyes. Lay your crown and worship the King of Kings. Worship the Lord of Lords. Worship the Alpha. Worship the Omega. Worship the one who knew every strand on your just worship him we lay on worship not only do we worship you God but we're, we're unashamed to worship you we're not embarrassed to worship you we don't we don't care who sees us we're not shy we, we, we worship you with joy with pride unashamed unashamed and that's the the word of encouragement that I want to give you this morning is to be unashamed. The Apostle Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. All this, oh, I don't want to say that I'm a Christian because I might lose out on that opportunity or I don't want them to, to know that I fast and pray because they might treat me differently. This kind of mentality, it's, it's, it's got to stop now. Because, because you know what? You know what? Now, today, we are seeing communities that are unashamed to be who they are. That's right. We're seeing, you can cross the road, and, and on the zebra crossing, there's, there's, there's colors. And when we see those colors, we understand what that means. That's and we right. can see that there are people from a community ashamed to say who they are. That's right. Why are we unashamed to let people know who we are? Why are we unashamed to let people know the God that we serve? That's got to stop now. That's got to stop now. You see, you can receive an email. And I know nowadays, on the signature of the email, it will say their name and then what they want you to refer them as. You understand what I'm saying? It'll say, oh, this person, he, him. This person, she, her. That person, you said it over here. <laughs> well, you understand that they're, they're unapologetic. They say, this is who I am. This is who I am. Now, I, I, I came from, oh, most of us here, we, we, we come from a generation where growing up it wasn't cool to be African it wasn't cool people would rather not say they're from Africa they might say oh my mum is from this tropical place my dad is from that exotic place I'm just this is just how I look I don't know why well we, 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 we will remember that time but today <laughs> In mainstream media, we're seeing Africans everywhere. Airlines, they're having a field day because everyone wants to go back to Africa. Because why? Because they were unapologetic about who they were. This is who I am. 
this is my culture, this is my lifestyle. And we were, if you want to use the word, forced to succumb to it. And now, look, it's become mainstream. So as Christians, as believers, as followers of Christ, we need to let people know, listen, I understand that this is what you do. But this is who I am. This is who I am. This is the God that I serve. This is the life that I've chosen to live because of the one who died for me. So you can do what you're doing, that's fine. But I'm going to do what I'm doing. I'm going to do what I'm doing. And let me just give you a quick addendum to that. I know that... So, okay, so, quickly, quickly. I, I know our time, I know. Quickly, so, my line of work is in the entertainment field. And I know there's many people that are in the entertainment field. And I'm sure this happens in, in many other industries that because of what you stand for there are certain opportunities that you won't get there's certain opportunities that you won't get there's I am an actor and there's many many times in my early career there were all types of scripts that would land on the table scripts that would compromise everything that I stand for all types of scripts but today the scripts are few because my agent will tell these people you cannot give this to Idris because of who he is and what he stands for. So the opportunities are fewer because of who I am and because they respect me. So let me just encourage you, if you're not being invited to certain meetings, if you're not being invited to certain tables, don't be offended because in the weirdest way, they say, no, 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 no. You can't bend that person, so don't call them. No, 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 you can't, you can't mess with that person, so don't call them. You know, I went to, I went to Africa. Is there any um, Jamaicans in the house? Jama yeah, 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 yeah. I know there's a J Jamaican parable that says, uh, Duppy no hoofy, hoofy frighten. Yeah, 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 yeah. What does that mean? What does, that means ghosts, they know who to scare. They know who to play with. But when we stand who we are firmly in Christ, you can't be bended. So when we go out today, when you live your life, it can't just be Sunday that people will see that you're a Christian. People need to see you're a Christian on Monday, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on. Be bold in who you are. And most importantly, be unashamed. Unashamed is the key. Amen, 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 amen. I know, I know, I know as, as Christians, sometimes we feel like life is restricted because we're Christians, because there's certain things that we can't do anymore. Oh, I, can't, I can't do that. I'm a Christian. I, I can't do this anymore. And it might feel like you're kind of in a prison. I know Pastor mentioned prison last week. It might feel like that. But let me just give you one word of encouragement. If you put my scripture up, this came from David. This is David that was after God's own heart. This is David. He says, I was young and now I am old. Now, you know, in those days, people were living up to 500, 600, 7,000. Yeah, yes, you've seen a lot. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Okay, okay, okay. So maybe you guys didn't hear that because the first service, when I said that, everyone went crazy. I was young. And now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. So if you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for your children and for your children's children. God will not forsake you. If you believe that, shout amen. Amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. It's hard to stick to time. It's hard to stick to time. I'm sorry. sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, let me just rush through these announcements. Um, so as you know, we have the, the midweek exchange. Every Wednesday, we meet at seven, uh, 6 a.m. to pray. And we come into church, into the building at 7.30 um, for Bible studies. So we also are still fasting on Wednesdays. You are encouraged to continue if you would like to stop. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's fine, but ah. 
gift aid. Gift aid. For those of you that have completed a diff a gift aid declaration form, we thank you. In case you haven't, remember for every pound that you give, we as a church can claim 25p. So it's very, very quick. If you just scan the QR code and fill out the form, you will be helping us out massively. The Shaping Lives mission. Uh, for those who are already on the mission with us, we thank you for your, your support and your monthly donations. If you haven't yet already and you would like to be a part of Shaping Lives, you know, this is one of the phrases that this church was founded on shaping lives so let's 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 shape lives let's let's impact lives of the young ones and you can see the details there and you can be a part of it for a two-year commitment uh the medical clinic on the 28th of april after the second service they'll be having a medical clinic so if you know you want to come and get some advice maybe some second opinions all of this stuff there please scan that qr code or take a screenshot of it and book a slot 28th of April after the second service. Okay, uh, G men, do I have men in the house? Please make some noise to me. I said, men, make some noise to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I well, I well, G men will be hosting their first event of the year themed decompress, and I'm pretty sure the title explains that all. Decompress, men, men, you've got to be there because it's important for us as men to come together as a community, to reason with each other, to discuss, and most importantly, to decompress. So please, the 18th of May, 11 a.m., don't worry about food, breakfast is free. You don't have to go in somewhere and pay. Breakfast is free. Please, G-men, we need to see you. Legacy team, legacy team. The legacy team will be having an event on the 22nd of April at 7 p.m. This is going to be on Zoom. They will be at the same time, but different sessions. So the first one is financial management. The second one is world creation. Debt down, debt down, debt down. I said what? If you know that one speaks to you, don't put your hand up. Just be there at 7 o'clock. And the second one is investment. Investment. I said what? If that one speaks to you, please be there. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. There's some congratulations in the house. Someone say, woo -hoo. Okay, so firstly, we want to congratulate Godfred and Nana on the birth of their beautiful bouncing baby boy. Congratulations. Both parents and baby are doing well, are doing well. Second congratulations in the house. We have a congratulations to Ernest and Fiona on the beautiful bouncing baby boy. Congratulations. Both parents are doing well. We have another congratulations in the house. See, this house is Congratulations, so stay here, stay here. Congratulations to Tunde and Whitney. Ah! Wow. Come and see, come and see what the Lord has done. Hey, 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 come on. Listen, man, this is a house where people get married. <laughs> Okay, we have the last announcement. If I can invite, <laughs> if I can invite Deborah to the stage, make some noise for Deborah. Okay, so we're going to the first worship night of the year, and it is titled "The Meeting Place." Um, in in anticipation of that, we would encourage you to read Exodus three, um, and it's where Moses encounters God for the first time at the burning bush. It's a place where God gives him a word, where he equips him he empowers him and we're believing that as we spend time under the atmosphere of worship God is going to release a word he's going to equip us he's going to empower us so tell a friend to tell a friend it's happening here at the citadel um, the doors will open at 7 and we kick off at 7 30. am I going to see you there church all right then thank you to this wonderful woman of God <laughs> so guys please online I need some fire emojis. Make sure you're liking, you share, you subscribe, you 
follow us on Instagram and please follow your pastor. Please. You know he was asking for some love. Let's show our pastor some love. Ah. It's not good. It's not good enough. We need to do better. Okay? Everybody say amen. 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 Okay, insignia. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Amen, church. We're going to continue in the atmosphere of worship. So we're going to ask everyone to rise to their feet. Amen. And sometimes in this world, there's just so much noise that we find around. And we just need to shut off that noise and focus our eyes on God and just worship him. So right now, what I want you to do is forget about the noise and just focus your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Nothing else matters. My long desire is to worship you. I live, Jesus, to worship you. I live, I live to worship you. Let me hear just a congregation to sing that. To worship you, I live. Hey, hey. To worship you, lift your voice and sing. To worship you, I live. To worship you, to worship you, to worship you, to worship you I live. To worship you, I live. Sometimes you don't have any words to sing. But oh, 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 from the depths of our hearts, we cry. Words to speak, but oh, 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 oh,
our Heavenly Father. From the depths of our heart, we sing, oh, hallelujah. I will raise up to praise you. On a Monday, I rise up to praise you. Come on. on a Tuesday, I rise up to praise you. Yeah. On a Wednesday, I rise up to praise you. On a Thursday, I rise up to praise you. On a Friday, I will say I'm tired. Yeah. On a Saturday, I rise to praise you. On a Sunday, I rise to praise. I rise to praise. I rise. some time giving him glory. <laughs> oh, when you have nothing else to say, just lift your hands. I want everyone here to lift their hands and say, oh. Praise. 
You're worthy. 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 Sing you're worthy. Sing you're worthy. If you came to church, you need to be able to praise God. You need to say, we praise you. You need to say, we honor you. You need to say, we glorify your name. Because when you go to Asake, you start shouting and screaming there. While you're in church, I want you, if you're not ashamed, to give God a shout in the house. Amen, 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 amen. High five someone before you sit down and say, I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. All right. Those who are still waiting outside, we're going to prepare some uh, stuff for you, get some chairs and uh, get you seated in the name of the Lord God. So uh, they're going to start calling you to come up here. Those who are privileged, wonderful, beautiful looking children of God. Uh, just come and join me upstairs. I, I, I'm shocked you came back after last Sunday. <laughs> I went to him and said, Jesus, please. Uh, but you came back. It shows that this is a church of people who love the word. Who love the word. And thank you for coming back. You're in for good shock this uh, where we now? afternoon. And I believe that God will bless you in Jesus' name. Just... Um, he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be glorified. There is no other name than the name of Jesus. Come on, uh, keep coming forward. Keep coming forward. They'll put you there. Some still some empty seats here. Uh, just let them come forward so we can create create room and waiting. Can I just say while they're preparing the whole place, I want to say uh, thank you for those who uh, honored us, those who contributed so generously 
to uh, the barrel of a patriarch in the uh, a matriarch, sorry, in the house who Mama Bola, who has been such a blessing. I was proud of Washi Tabernacle. I was so proud of Washi Tabernacle, especially all of you, the young ones that came in, helped serving, helped with the food, washing the plates and all that kind of stuff. Guys, you are on par. You, 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 you rock. Uh, and I just want to say a very big thank you for that and God bless you. And also a big shout out to those who came yesterday who were um, uh, at the uh, Cornerstone. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming. It was such a blessing and I believe that God will bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there anything else that I need to say? Uh, eh? Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, for those who were here on the last day of the fast, uh, we had this guy that brought in some bread. You understand? It's called soft bread. It's called Lulu bread. Uh, and then there was a, a, a cry for him to bring it back. So after, between the first and second service, there was a queue. It nearly, they nearly killed each other in, in buying that bread. I think there's a tray left. Uh, don't go out during the sermon. <laughs> But you can rush there. Uh, he's promised to try to bring it once because it's all the way in Southeast. So he's brought it down, and uh, he just he just said, if you if you if you take a bite as you're going home, you'll finish the bread before you get there. Uh, you will know you have sinned, uh, and then Jesus will wash you uh, clean. Um, so please, uh, outside there, if you want to, you can get the last tree there. Uh, I'm not sure how many is left, but but. Uh, but before we go on, I, I want to say shout, give a shout out to my online. Come and give a shout out to my, to my homies. My homies online. God bless you and God keep my fam. Uh, God keep you and cause his, uh, his favor to shine upon you. Thank you so much for joining us. We know you are involved in the service. Put that come to church uh, next week. Uh, but we want to say thank you to everyone. Uh, today I've got a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful I've had a bit of a fallout with some people in that God has laid it on my heart to bring people of the younger generation, younger than my generation, to be able to speak to you so you guys know clearly that it's not one dinosaur uh, that is speaking <laughs> to you. Uh, somebody of your generation, someone of your, uh, that you can relate to. And you could see that we did that last year. We've got one this year. So, uh, sorry that they're getting you to sit by the side. You will still be blessed. Sorry, my apologies. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, God bless you. Uh, i keep you. Um, but also, we, 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 I, I came in contact with this man quite a number of years ago. I had no idea even that it's, He's, he's snuck into our services more than two or three times. Um, but I have a, a, a great uh, spiritual daughter that, uh, as I followed him, she, she knew who he was. And I said, whenever he's in town, that uh, I want him to come. So he came into town last week. As he flew into town, I flew into his diary. Uh, just that quick. You have to make things quick, you know. Um, uh, Adolu Adefasi, he is a torchbearer and a thought leader and a change agent. Um, and he also grew up in church. He is the resident pastor, serves as the resident pastor of Guiding Light Assembly and lead pastor of Ignite uh, GLA in Lagos, Nigeria. But also under his fantastic father, who is the pastor, Pastor Wale Adefasi, that has character and legitimacy over the years in Lagos, Nigeria. I know him from afar, but when you're looking for churches and pastors that have character, you understand, no issues or tissues. Uh, you, 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 I'm I know what I'm talking about. Uh, but, uh, but so he's come out, come up under that great pedigree. But also he stands in his own right, also as an art and entertainment in the art and entertainment in industry. He's the executive producer and host of Shop Talk, an innovative creative talk show engaging in various topics that affect the lives of many, both locally and globally, and introducing a Christ-like perspective as he goes. He's an actor who has been involved in some of Nollywood's most successful productions. How many people have watched The Wedding Party 1 and 2? Yeah. 
you see some of the we have the if you haven't how many people have watched the recent one which is called king of boys what are you guys watching <laughs> yeah you're watching car i won't even finish the surname uh, or, or you're watching dating dating or just married no 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 Watch him. So he's also, and then it's a film called Coming from Santa. And most of these things he's been involved with. But above all, he is a man of God who loves God and also is, has a passion for his generation. And he's also here with his wonderful, wonderful, beautiful wife, Alicia. Uh, and they've been married for four years and God has been doing good to them. Worship Tabernacle, please welcome with me, standing up to welcome this great guy uh, into our church, uh, Adolu. Adifasi, come on, man. Thank God. I don't like people reading bios. When they read your bio, it puts pressure. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Ty and Pastor Femi, for this opportunity. God bless you. Thank you. I do not take it lightly. And like uh, Pastor Ty mentioned, I'm here with the most beautiful lady in the room, my best friend and my wife, Alicia. I just want to honor her because I would not be where I am if not for her. Can anybody say that? I will not be here if not for God, though, but I will not be here if not for my wife. I understand those things. Um, I think it's very key. There's something that has been said throughout both services that I think is so important to key into, which is Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power unto salvation for those that believe. I know that we are not in this room for no reason. You come to church because of encounter. You come to church because there's something that you have seen the hope of in Christ. That when God opens up a window to the possibilities that exist in him, it would be foolishness to turn your back. And in that same way, that scripture speaks so heavily to me because it means that you have to carry the vessel of the nature of Christ, your love for Christ, you cannot be a shy Christian. You can be a shy person, no? but you cannot be a shy Christian. Because when you see God, your life has encountered something and you might not have seen the full manifestation of it, but what is hiding behind the encounter with Christ, you know. Because the Bible says that he is one who has already finished the thing before he starts it. So though your eyes have not seen it, the possibility is enough for you to recognize that God has finished my story. And it is a story that is full of hope. It is a story that is good. A story that will give me a hope and a future. A story to bring me to an expected end that whatever your circumstance is today when you engage with the truth of who Christ is the way it will end people will look at you and you will be shining because that is who God has called us to be and the truth of who we are in Christ I, I always love when I stop to think about it you know sometimes we read the Bible and we gloss over things because it's easy to read a text and you know, just think, okay, well, this is a story in the Bible. The Bible says in Genesis 1, it says in the beginning, God hovered. The Bible, the Spirit of God hovered over the earth. And God spoke and said, let there be light. There's a progression of creation all the way up until the very sixth day, God creates man and places man in the garden. But how did that happen? God said, they talked between themselves. He said he made a committee meeting with himself he called the holy spirit and he called jesus and he said let us make man in our image when god created the birds he just said make bird bird happened when he said let's make the cattle he made them he spoke but when he wanted to make you he looked into himself we always underestimate because you've been living so long in this humanity you have forgotten your divinity but God, when he created you, he looked at himself. 
When he created me, I can speak for myself. He looked at himself and he said, I have called this one to be a leader. Well, I have leadership capacity. I will take it from me and put it in him. He said, I want him to be creative. Well, I know that I'm creative. So I will take from my own creativity and pour it into him. Everything that is in you came from God. And so the nature of who you are is who he is. And it often it feels like pride to take on who God says he is. That anything God says, when you, you know, if I come as I was telling you that me, I'm a leader, I'm a change agent, I'm somebody who's meant to turn around the captivity of a nation and God, it looks like a proud man. But what does God say about pride? The Bible says, humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God. And so when you are walking in obedience to God, you are walking in humility. It is actually pride to do this false humility thing that we do to say, no, nah, I'm just a small guy. Me, I'm not small. <laughs> I know you. He has called you to great things. And the very nature of who God is, is spirit. The Bible says in John 4, when Jesus encounters the woman at the well, and they've engaged in a conversation. And Jesus has done this interesting thing where he's managed to find her. He's managed to get her intrigue. She's just come for water. And she's en ended up in a conversation with a man who for all her understanding shouldn't be talking to her. Because circumstances say Jews don't speak to Samaritans. But Jesus has spoken to her in a way that has piqued her interest. And through the conversation, he turns to her and he says, A time is coming where true worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. Because the Father desires such. And then he says, God is spirit. God is spirit. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit is spirit. When we think of the spirit of God, we only think of the Holy Spirit. He is saying both the Father is spirit. The Holy Spirit is spirit. But Jesus too is spirit. When we think of Jesus, we only think of the man that lived for 33 and a half years. But Jesus, the Bible says that even before he, when he spoke, he spoke, he said, before Abraham was I am. So he has finished his tenure in humanity, but his tenure as a spirit goes on. So the nature of who God is is spirit. And therefore, we must recognize the nature of who we are is spirit. The Bible says that if you live by the flesh, you will die by the flesh. But if you live by the spirit, you will put to death all things of the flesh and you shall live. So for you to get into a place where you are going to live, life exists only in the spirit. In the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve promised from God was the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And yet in their humanity, they did not that their spirit man was dead. Their sensitivities to the things of died in a moment. And one of the big problems we have so often, and one of the tricks that the enemy uses, is because you're so exposed to humanity, you don't... And so you also miss out on the life you have received in the Spirit the moment you said, I believe. Because sometimes you think that that life is a wish and a promise for a later date but you are living in it now. He said the moment that you give your life to him and proclaim your faith, his spirit becomes embedded in you and you have become an eternal being. What did he say to the woman at the well? He says, if you knew who stood before you, you would ask him and he will give you living water and it shall be as a spring bursting into everlasting life. And so on the inside of you is eternal life. On the inside of you is who God has said that you are. The only thing is that you have to learn to bring it from the within to without. 
We have spent so much of our lives looking outside for what is inside. Saying, if I could only build this relationship with this guy, if I know this person, this guy will connect me, I will. Men cannot help you. It's everything. The Bible says, even when men help you, you must recognize it is the Spirit of God that did it. It is the Spirit of God that did it. That's why Abraham had to get to a place where he said, after he defeated the sons of so- and, and won back Sodom and Gomorrah all because of his, um, his, his nephew, he said, if I take from you the king of Sodom, you would one day go and say that it is because you that I am where I am. He said, I can never let it be. And so who comes? The king of Salem. The king of Salem, the king of peace. Who is God? And so he comes and he receives an offering from the king of Salem, from the king of peace, from the Lord himself. And he gives an offering back because he recognizes it came from God. And so we are spirit beings and we must recognize the spiritual nature to how we live. That the spiritual things are essential to how we live. When the Bible says that God is spirit, he is talking about every aspect of himself. So in John 1, when when the Bible says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, then you realize that the word too, which we know is Jesus Christ, is spirit. And so the word has such a powerful place to play in the life that we live, because words are spiritual. Words are spiritual. In actuality, words are the first engagement that the spirit has with the physical world. Bible says that he said, let there be light. And there was light. Well, let me tell you something that's... If man was living then, he would not have seen light. It is until days later that God created the sun and you could see the light. So the light existed, but the manifestation had not yet come. So God has spoken things in your life, and your eyes have not yet seen them, because they haven't yet come to manifestation, but it is. Because when something exists in the spirit, it exists in the world, because the spirit is the first point of anything's existence. Bible says in John 1 that everything came out of him, and nothing existed that exists outside of him so nothing in the world exists outside of the spirit and that's the first thing that we must recognize my core scripture from today is from Ephesians 6 verse 12 where the Bible says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood I'm going to stop there it's going to take our time we have to recognize that the world that we live in is spiritual And therefore, the things that we are fighting and the things we are engaging with, they are not flesh and blood. They are not flesh and blood. It looks like it is flesh and blood, but it is not. That is not what you are fighting. I look at the story of David, because David to me is one of my favorite people in the Bible for the singular purpose that the man had the kind of faith that before Jesus died that the Holy Spirit might come, he lived by the Spirit. Because he had a revelation of who he was in God. That meant that he could live by the Spirit before the promise of the Holy Spirit. And so David has been anointed king by Samuel. And the story of what, how this happens, I'm sure we all know it. But God sends Samuel and says, I want you to go and anoint the next king in the house of Jesse. Right? Samuel goes to the house of Jesse and he tells Jesse... I believe one of your sons is the next king of Israel. has been proclaimed by God and I've come to anoint him. Can you gather your sons? And so he goes and he gathers a load of his sons. Everyone but David. Because this is beyond, like this is a realm of somebody looking at you and not seeing who you are. To the point of which every single person is an option but this one. And so he gathers his sons And Samuel looks at Eliab, the first son, and says, this guy, this looks like kingship to me. This looks like my idea of what a king is. And God says, no, that's not the one. 
He goes through everybody to the point that David, he now, he now says, do you have any other sons? So I, reluctantly, Jesse's like, you know what I do? Right, send for him. So he calls David. And I'm sure Samuel looked at David and said, I don't think this is it. But when he lifted the horn over his head, all came pouring out. There are things that God has put oil on your life and you have no reason why. People will look at you and they will say, there's no way this guy can carry the oil on his life. There's no way this woman could carry the oil on her life. She has no virtue, no reason for it. I've seen her. I've seen the way she thinks. I've seen the way she walks about life. It could never be you. But God has said, it is you. And so David stands and he takes this oil and he's anointed king. And that's all well and good. Imagine somebody coming and telling you, I, I anoint you, you're a billionaire. You look at your accounts, nothing has changed. <laughs> so nothing has shifted in the natural for him. And it feels like nothing has shifted in the natural for you. And David goes back to the place where he was working. Continues to be a shepherd for his father. And it's something that I have not realized up until recently that I thought about it. So that his father didn't seem to like him. There are a lot of theories that would say that Jesse didn't actually believe David was his son, his blood. And so he had already written him off and maybe he treated him wrong based on how he felt. But David stayed faithful. God does not anoint you for the sake of position. He anoints you for the sake of you becoming a person worthy to sit in the promise. Because if it is just about the promise, we all live in this earth, you become king, sure, and then you die, will your kingship continue? He was more interested in David becoming the kind of person he could trust with people. So David sits and he serves. David continues in his role of being the faithful son, taking care of the shepherd, until one day a lion comes and tries to kill the sheep. I don't know. I don't know about you. Me, I'm out. But David stands between the sheep and the lion. And he says, I'm ready to die for these ones. And that's well and good. And then another day, a bear comes. And David stands again between the sheep and the bear and says, I'm. Then God looks at him and says, Now I know I can trust you with people. Now I know I can trust you with people. So, what is a king? A king is somebody who stands in the gap for people. A kingship is not about leadership. It's about service. And so he's ready to die for the sheep. He says, if you can die for sheep, I'm sure that you can die for people. And so one day his father calls him on just another day and tells him, go and, go and take bread and sandwiches to your brothers. And there's this guy, Goliath, speaking all sorts of profanity against his people. And David remembers, I am king of Israel. These are my people. These are the people God has called me to serve and protect. And so he stands in the gap between the people and Goliath. And he says, I will die. He has not become king officially. But this guy is a king. And the test of his kingship comes stage after stage. So when he goes and he is working for Saul and Saul has seen the fruitfulness of David's life and people are singing, this guy killed 10,000 but Saul only killed one. Envy enters Saul's heart and Saul is determined to kill David. But David, because his character will not let him, refuses to kill Saul. If David killed Saul, he'd have determined his own end. Because when you are ready to kill 
for what you desire, the next king will kill you too. And so God sees in him somebody ready to die and ready to serve and maintaining character. And so now David sits in that position, ready to do what is right, not what seems quick. Not what seems like it will position me where I need to be as soon as possible. And so when David does that, we see and ask who he is. It is a wisdom that David has. That what I am fighting is not flesh and blood. I am not fighting Saul. If I was fighting Saul, the moment I kill him, I become king. But he was not fighting Saul. He was fighting the spirit that animated Saul. It's why when Saul dies, David doesn't become king straight away. Because he was not contending with man. When we look at things from the place of our flesh, we contend with men and realize it still does not carry you where you thought you were meant to be. Because you have to then look deeper and see what is the spirit I ought to be wrestling in this space. The Bible says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It says, but against principalities. What are principalities? In Daniel 10, Daniel has been praying and crying out. And the Bible says that he cried out and he prayed. And the Lord said that even the moment that you prayed, the moment you humbled yourself to your God, that I heard your words. And because of your words, I have come. But for 21 days, the prince of Persia, withheld me, withstood me. And so there are principalities in the atmosphere that you are in. For example, the Prince William is the Prince of Wales. He has a governorship over a territory. And so we wrestle against principalities. There are spirits that are taking dominance in the territories you are called to. And if you do not see them and you only see men, you will fail and falter in the place where God has called you. And you will think it's because God did not predestine for you to be there. But it's because you wrestled flesh and blood when you ought to be fighting the principalities. When you ought to get into the atmosphere and in the place of prayer, God, show me what is at work in this space. What is it that I am fighting in this place? Yes, you called me into the entertainment industry, but I don't even see how I'm going to progress to a place of impact because you do not know. Now you're worried, if I can meet so-and-so, if I can meet this great executive, then I will have this role and this position. You are not looking for men. You are working against principles. Principalities. Now stand. What spirit is at work where I am? And guess what? The spirit in them is less than the spirit in you. You have to see the spirit at work in you. Now it says the same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is in you. And so when you are wrestling against men, then it's like David and Goliath. Goliath is too big, I will lose. But when it was even Goliath that engaged the conversation at the level of the Spirit of God, he said he spoke wickedly of the God of Israel. And now you have engaged in a battle where what is within is far bigger than what is without. But we must recognize when we are fighting against principalities. You must know. So we know the world we're in today. He just helps me set the ground so that I can speak freely. <laughs> God sent a sign to Noah of a rainbow. And men have come and changed the meaning of the rainbow. And now there's some rainbow spirits at work in the world. And you're worried that if I go into this atmosphere and I do not compromise myself, how will I sustain myself? The spirit in that thing bows in the presence of the spirit in you. There are ways in which, because the, the, the agenda in the world is always to spread its own mind and heart into yours. But where will you stand? 
If you don't know what you stand for, you would. Bible says ye are gods, but yet you would die as men. Why? Because lack of revelation to identity causes you to die like a person that you are not. If you live according to the flesh, you die according to the flesh. But the moment you recognize you are a God, you are made in the image of Christ, and that within you is power that can supersede anything that the world has to offer, then it is impossible for you to die as a man. You will not fail, you will not falter. You will not enter any area of lack because your revelation tells you you are more. We live at the level of our revelation. We live at the level of our revelation. What you know about yourself will determine how far you will go. There are people, so I look at the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son runs away. He says, I want my inheritance. And he goes and he squanders it all. The Bible says that he finally remembers when he's living in a pigsty. That even the slaves in my father's house don't live like this. Let me get up and go back. I'm ready to be a servant. At least I will eat well. So he goes back. And his father throws this amazing feast for him. But the person we don't look often at is the prodigal son's brother. Who lived in the house. He did not leave. And there's something what the Bible says about the story is that his father divided to them their inheritance. So his father now owns nothing because he has given it to one son and the other son. But this, the son that stayed behind is living like he does not own. So when his father's throwing a feast, he's looking, he's getting envious and he doesn't go to his father to complain. He goes to a servant to say what is happening here. When you look to servants for wisdom, you will get a servant's perspective. And so envy has now entered into his mind. He's frustrated, he's angry. He says, I'm not even going into this house. Imagine this palace is there. It maybe it's raining outside that day and he's just being swamped. But because his heart has hardened, he can't receive what is inside for him. And so his father comes out and he said, why wouldn't you do this for me? I've been here, I've worked, I've slaved for you. His mentality is I'm working for the father, not I'm working with the father. And so he's living at the level of his revelation because his father goes to tell him that if you wanted them to kill the fattened calf, you could have told them, aka it was yours, but you did not use what you had because you did not know you had it. The word of God is rich. In 2 Corinthians, the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not, but they are mighty in God through the pulling down of strongholds. And when the Bible says that, it's referring, it's immediately after the armor of God. And every single aspect in the armor of God is defensive, the helmet of salvation, all of that. But the only thing that is offensive is the sword of the Spirit, which the Bible goes on to elaborate and say, which is the Word of God. You have a weapon. If you do not know it, you cannot walk in the power that it yields. So God said, I have given you a weapon, my Word, and there is nothing that my Word cannot do change. There's nothing it cannot shift. There's nothing it cannot move. There's no room it cannot carry you into. There's no wall it cannot break down. And yet you are walking like one who does not know. I love that scripture. It says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they are mighty in God to so the pulling down of strongholds to so the casting out of imaginations. The word imagination is powerful. If you understand how powerful your imagination is, your life will change. Because there is nothing in this world that exists outside of imagination. Everything you look at in this world, somebody first imagined it. God first planted an image in someone's mind. And yet there are negative imaginations that are causing your life to go in a track that God did not call for it to go. The Bible says... God himself, speaking in Genesis 11, looks at the men who wanted to build the Tower of Babel. And he said, if I let them, because they have one understanding, a unity, nothing that they imagine shall be impossible for them. 
Your imagination is a treasure source of great destiny. There is so much that God can unleash in your imagination. And the enemy, like the liar that he is, will sow things into your imagination to contaminate you from getting where God wants to take you. And there are so many places where you have to see it. If we are not sensitive to the things we are dealing with and recognize that even the things in my imagination, they came from a spiritual place, we will miss out on the things that we are called to do because we think this is who I am. The Bible says that in, in, in the book of Mark and Matthew that Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he turns to them and he says, who do men say that I am? And so the disciples turn around and they say, you know, some say that you're a prophet. Some say that you're out of the forward of Elijah. And he says, but who do you say I am? And the disciples, they haven't really gotten to that place of wisdom and understanding yet. They're not sure. Some of them are scared. But Peter, he, he has this reckless courage, which we've seen throughout Peter's life. And Peter turns and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And in Matthew 16, Jesus responds to him and says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. You couldn't get this from the natural, but it came to you from my father in heaven. It came to you from my father who is what? Spirit. So it came to you by revelation of the spirit of God that you have the insight to know who I am. And so now he's seen this, but one of the problems that we run into is sometimes when we have been in our faith for long enough, we think our revelation means me and God, we know each other. There's nothing new here. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's nothing new I have to learn from the word of God. So sometimes you don't want to you know, show up at church or you come and maybe you're preaching along with the preacher because you're like, okay, I get where he's going. So like, there's nothing to... God says that pride, yeah, will suss it out. Because that familiarity gets you to the place of pride. So Peter, in this situation, has gotten this revelation. And, and Jesus has let him know where it came from. And now his chest is up a little bit. And he's feeling himself. He's like, me and God, we speak to one another. I understand things. He's probably looking at the other disciples like, you didn't see it, did you? <laughs> and then the enemy comes and sows something. So just moments later, verses later, not chapters later, not days later, not months later, verses later, in the same story, God continues to speak to his disciples and he continues to unveil to them the things to come and the fact that he's going to die. And Peter is looking like, nah, nah, nah. Me, I know the spirit I collected my wisdom from. There's no way that that wisdom will not let you die. So he looked at Jesus and he took Jesus aside. I don't know if you can imagine doing that. You have a leader God is called, it is God himself. And you take him aside. And the Bible says he rebukes Jesus. So he looks at Jesus and he's like, how dare you say that thing? Don't believe what the devil is saying to you. You're not going to die. And we find ourselves rebuking the word of God because we have no discernment to where the spirit, what spirit has laid a thought in your heart. And Jesus has to, Jesus turns, he sees the disciples, he says, this is a moment that I must highlight what has happened. And so he turns to Peter and he says, get thee behind me, Satan. I don't, I, 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 I don't understand. But you just told me that, that, that my father in heaven was the only one that revealed to me who you are. And yet you're calling me Satan. I said, no, I didn't call you Satan. I was speaking to the animator on the inside of you that has sown a thought into your life and you thought it was your own, it was not you. And then the Bible goes on to say that Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan, for your mind are not on the things of God, but on the things of men. So when your attention is looking at the flesh, you see things that are not God. But because pride had made you feel like you knew God already, you missed out and you did not discern that this was not the voice of God. There's something God used to tell me that I, I, that I, I used to say. I don't know, say that God. I mean, I assigned to God things that came from the flesh in Jesus' name. <laughs> that I used to say, really to kind of build courage for me, uh, which was if I'm right, it's God. And if I'm me, if I'm not, it's me. And God rebukes me as I was preparing for this, that not everything that you say is you. 
There are thoughts that the enemy sows into your life and you think that they're your thoughts. You hear the voice and you think, I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. There's no way God would use me. And the devil has sown that thought, but you wear it like it's your own. And God wants to remind you, not all of those things are you. The enemy's greatest deception is to deceive those that we do not. He does not exist. And so if he can sow all his thoughts, it's why the way the world works, right? They've got you looking at all sorts of spiritual things and telling you that these things are just normal. I, I, I am blown by the same people that want to tell you that the notion of God is outrageous um, because of this supernatural fantasy or unrealistic nature of it are the same people that call them them they. I, 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 I'm blown because I don't understand where you get to the nature where someone can choose their gender. But the notion of God, that's not possible. But the fact that I, it's possible you got my gender wrong, that one is possible. We then start looking at unrealistic things and calling them realistic. And then looking at the things of God and saying that's not realistic. That's not an option. Because the devil has sowed all kinds of thoughts. From when you were a child, somebody told you you weren't good enough. Someone told you you weren't going to make it. You weren't smart. And so you thought, what is the possibility that God would use me in a space where it took intelligence and ideas and wisdom? Because you think, I don't have wisdom. No one's ever looked at me and called me wise. So... How is it possible that I would be wise? And then you've taken on the enemy's thoughts and called them your own. He is the father of lies. And the deep thing about him is he can take something that is true and turn it into a lie. God, when he speaks, the Bible says he cannot lie. So anything God says becomes true. Jesus said that anything the devil speaks becomes a lie because he is the father of lies. And so... When he comes up against Jesus himself, he takes the word of God and he uses the word to try and deceive the word. And what he has done is he has taken the truth and he has corrupted it into a lie. And if you're not wise enough or intelligent enough or you're not hungry enough or discerning enough, you will take the lie and call it truth. And so we have to become discerning of the things of the spirit of God. We have to become aware. And just as God rebukes me that not everything that comes from me is me, he also rebukes not everything that is true is him. Sometimes the, the, law, the, 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 the enemy will take truths and turn them into lies. So when Saul, now Paul, is walking with the disciples and he's going around preaching, and this Bible says in, in Acts 16 that there's a slave girl who's going behind them and continually for the whole point of their journey crying out behind them, these ones are disciples of God and they're speaking the gospel and proclaiming the truth. She's telling the truth. But her discernment, Paul's discernment helps him to realize that the source of this truth has turned the truth into a lie. And so he has to turn to her and says, get out of her, you unclean spirit. And so you must recognize the spirit at work. Otherwise, you are open to the deception of the enemy. Not everything that is true is God. When God speaks, he speaks truth. But the enemy can take truth and contaminate it. And so we must learn to become discerning of the environments we are in of what it is that the enemy is trying to sow. The things he has told you about yourself that reflect in no way the truth of your identity. But you have worn it for so long, it feels like the only thing you could possibly be. I would have told you that there's a limit to how high you can grow. You will never get past this level. People will look at you and say, nah, he doesn't look it. Doesn't carry himself like it. Doesn't have the posture. And so when the enemy throws these lies at you and you continue to wear them, they become a stronghold. And a stronghold, the Bible is very clear. So what happens is, I'll use the example of like the White House. If the White House is being attacked, the president gets taken down to a bunker, which is like bomb proof. It's strong. That's why they call it a stronghold. It's a place that's so fortified 
that it is hard to penetrate. And there are thoughts that the enemy has sown into your mind that have become so fortified that it's hard for you to break them down. You've believed the lie for so long, the truth seems impossible to believe. There, there's, a nation, there's, there's a nature in biology that will talk about the way the mind works and tell you that the first source of information is often what you'll take as truth. So if somebody introduces a lie to you and calls it truth, it now becomes the lens with which your mind perceives all things. And so when someone tells you the truth, you'll take it through the lens of the lie and say, that can't be true. And so we have to be very careful at the sources of our information. What is it that we are taking our credibility from? What is determining the things that you believe about yourself? What is determining what it ought to look like? One of the biggest reasons that we, 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 we fall into this error in Christianity is that we say that God will make your way prosperous, but then we define prosperity by the world standard. And so therefore, you, it, it's impossible for you. Your lens has been shapen to the point that you don't think you're successful when you are because you are looking for the world's definition of success. What does the Bible say prosperity is? The Bible says in, in, in very clear terms, when it says in Joshua 1.8, meditate on the word of God day and night, right? that you might see to do all that is written in it and you'll make your way prosperous. Prosperity is obedience. It is obedience. It is doing what God told you to do. The day that you're looking for more than that, you, ep you enter error. Anything God told you to do and you do it, you are being prosperous. Because you are walking in the direction of God. It is way too easy to, to, to change your standard and to chase the things of the world and find success in the world, which is actually failure, as opposed to running in the direction of God, not feel like a success because of what the world has told you and because people have told you you're missing out and in actuality you're walking in the direction of prosperity. That's why the Bible says that there are people who do things in the nature and standard of the world or they're doing things that are spiritual and they'll come and they will say, Lord, I did this in your name and he will say, I never knew you because your spirit and the thing that and animated you was unclean why did the man come and say that i want to buy from you the spirit and capacity to do the things that you are doing to paul because he thought that he could enter the gate in a worldly manner and still see heaven we need to combat the lies of the enemy. And the only way to do it is the word of God. You have to be hungry. You have to be hungry. The Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for the Lord, for they shall be filled. It looks to you as if water has not come out of this rock, but the rock is yielding its water. When Moses stamped on the rock and hit the rock and water poured out, when God told him to do it, he was was rigging an ink a representation of Jesus dying upon the cross. When the knife went into the, the, the into the side of Jesus Christ and the water came out, that's not natural, but that is life. And so God says, I have poured out water into your life. I have given you something and you must come and you must drink. And there are circumstances in your life that will not look like you are being satisfied because your satisfaction metric has been determined by the world. But God said, the moment you stay with me, I have already done it. It is the nature of who I am. I speak a thing, it comes to life. I say a thing and it is done. I'm not a man, I cannot lie. And so God has told you that you are more. God has told you that he is going to unlock things in your life. That you're going to be the same person that's going to change the industry I've called you into. And you're looking at the industry and thinking it's impossible. But God takes, this Bible says that the kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. Today it looks like you are far. But the moment God places you because you stood with him because you searched his word because you said I know there has to be more if you said it there has to be more if your word is something that unveils truth then I must sit on it I must sit in it my favorite scripture is Proverbs 25 2 the passion translation puts it this way it says that God hides or conceals the revelation of his word in the hiding place of his glory but 
honor of kings are those who search out diligently the deeper meaning of all it is that God says. Therefore, you sit with God's word. You look at it. My life hasn't changed yet, but that means that there is more for me to search. And when I unveil it, the water will pour because I'm searching in the spirit for spiritual things and the spirit commands the natural and your natural world will change the moment. That's why Jesus, when the when they asked him, how do I pray? He said that you have to get to the place we are bringing and seeking to bring the things of the spirit into the natural world. The Bible says that he did only that which he saw the father doing and therefore your eyes must learn to see what is the father doing. What is the father doing? The moment that he says it, he has done it. And so you're not there, you're not hiding in the word, looking for some veiled wish. The Bible says that faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Hope is not a bad thing. We make it feel like hope is bad because it's not faith. Without hope, you cannot have faith. And so you need an image. You need a picture. You need something that God has implanted in your heart. And he said, I'm going to take you to it. And I'm going to do it with you. And it seems impossible. Look at Noah and the ark. God said, I want you to build an ark because I'm bringing a flood. This man has never seen rain. He's never seen an ark. He doesn't know what an ark looks like. But God has said, I should build it. He sits with him. until so the ark becomes more than an idea and a notion and becomes something with details, comes something with measurements he can do. 1,000 cubits this way because you sat with him enough for him to give you the detail to carry you into the promise. The reason that so many Christians don't have what we'll call faith is not because they don't have faith, it's because they, they have wishes. Because you, 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 we, we think that if I hope for something, I'm just sitting here until God does it. And it's why the world seems to be operating at such a higher standard because when they have an image, they chase the image. They determine for the image. Yeah. Bible says faith without works is dead. What is works? Mm. Works is obedience. Mm. Works is doing what he said, when he said, how he said. Mm. It's not trying to work out what the trajectory ought to look like, what I think it looks like to get to this place. Yeah. It is looking in the place of the spirit, pulling from the spirit, and manifesting in the natural out of the place of obedience. But the spirit exists before the natural. We have to be spiritual beings. We have to be spiritual beings. I think clock zero a long time ago, guys. I'm just... There's something I feel very led to do. As I was praying yesterday, what God showed me was like a, a green smoke washing through this atmosphere. And I asked him, what does that mean? And he told me it's the spirit of envy. And there's circumstances in your life where you're looking at people and it looks like people have they've shot for the stars and you're wondering when me. And the spirit of envy wants to corrupt what he has called you to do. But as I prayed, I saw God. And it's funny because I think this is so powerful. But I saw a purple smoke come and washing through the atmosphere. And purple represents royalty. When the Bible says that the honor of kings is seen in how thoroughly they search out the deeper meaning, it's because you are a king. And you will say that if there's anyone here, you have been whitewashed with the spirit of envy and you see it. You see yourself wondering, when am I going to get there? When is my life going to change? God says you are a king and a priest. And the only way you shift from envy is to recognize who you are in the spirit. I just want to pray for anyone. I don't know if you can just come up to the altar. You recognize that envy has felt like it's consumed you. It's felt like you have been far too far from where God wants you. But God says, my spirit can eradicate anything that comes from the spirit of the world. Because the enemy is already under my feet. So if you can just come, just come quick. So I want to pray for anyone struggling with the spirit of envy. Shindi makandari basanduri mashandi di di di. Ye baranda manandi di busundi di makandi di basandi di di di. Anyone online feel like you're struggling with that spirit of envy? Feel like it's been hard for you? 
because you feel like you've worked hard enough, you've done enough, you've done everything you ought to do and things just aren't ticking for you like they ought to tick. Spirit of the living God. Oh, my shanda Lord, I just commit every single one who has come before you because they are not ashamed of your gospel, because they are not ashamed, and because the faith says that you can turn anything around. You are the one who opens doors that no man can shut and shuts doors no man can open. And God wants to build you that you can be who he has said that you are. And it comes by recognizing you already are. Nothing can keep you from the promises of God. Nothing can keep you from the promises of God. God, we combat every spirit of envy, every lie of the enemy, that is pointing daggers at people to make you think, why are they there and I'm not? We combat it because it is a lie. It is not who you are. The enemy has sown thoughts, but they are not yours. And the Bible said that God said to Jeremiah, I have called you to uproot and to break down. And so right now, by the Spirit of God, I uproot the spirit of envy. Bible says that he spoke to the, to the spirit that animated the man. He said, get out of him and the spirit got out. And so we speak now, get out of these children, your sons and your daughters. The spirit of envy has no place because the spirit of God is here. The spirit of God is here. These are your sons and your daughters, your kings and your queens. They are the ones that you have called, oh God, that you have spoken over them great lies. And you are the one that takes men from married clay and sets their feet upon a rock. And so we rebuke every lie of the enemy enemy he has spoken over your life every contaminating thought it has no place anytime the thought of envy comes into your heart you don't even have to stop and wonder why am i being envious it is not me and so when you speak and you turn to that you say you have no place here i don't know what you thought you saw that you could come and you could use me but the daughter and so enemy you have no place your authority is rebuked and devout we revoke the authority of the enemy because we are stepping in our place as spiritual people who walk by the power of the son of god god stir up their faith O lord and change their life captivity in a moment where it looks as a dream and so oh lord glorify the souls every single one and the spirit of envy shall not come near this place again in the name of jesus christ amen 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 So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I lay my hands upon these ones, authenticating the word from Pastor Delu that there will be no envy. You will walk in your own. Doors will start to open for you right now in the name of Jesus. And as you go back, there will be a transformation in your life where what other people do does not matter but what god will do on the inside of you so we rejoice over your life because as from now on he will make a way where there seems to be no way he's creating that rivers in the desert and a way in the wilderness you are going to see a transformation right now your identity will come out you will not be a photocopy of somebody else originality but god will start to lift your head like the head of a unicorn and anoint you with fresh oil and if you believe that somebody shout a loud amen 
Amen. Guys, God is going to make a way for you. I know the pleasure that comes upon you when you start to see other men uh, start to prosper and you're still in the same place. God says, stay where you are for God will meet you where you are. As Pastor Adedioli was saying, in the backside of the desert, so David was. But God created him and brought him into the forefront. Do not be under pressure. Don't commit suicide. Don't die because some things are happening with other people. The Bible says, look at the ends what it shall be for there is a spirit of grace upon all of you ladies all upon you all of you in front that the glory of the lord is upon you he will wipe away those tears i feel the almighty god here and it will turn you into a new person the one they left in the backside of the desert will be the one who will be in the forefront your time of obscurity has passed i decree prominence coming into i i want some people in church to be leave God with I see prominence coming to you right now in the name of Jesus where the glory of the Lord shall go before you in Jesus name I want the church to say a loud amen may the God of all comfort comfort you guys in Jesus name we pray amen you may go God go with God's blessing go with God's anointing go with the confidence that God has called one man all the way from Lagos to set you free from the shackles of the enemy church can we give Pastor Delu a good God bless you what a word what a word what a word and we believe the blessings of God is upon you in the name of Jesus we, 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 we decree that in Jesus name thank you so much for being such a blessing the thing about it that I'm, uh, I'm happy is because there is no diff there's a continuation of the word from what I preached on Sunday. I didn't even know you guys are going to come. Uh, <laughs> but there's a continuation of the word from what was preached last Sunday to what was preached today, to what Idris says, to what Deulu said. It's just like God is just bringing it together and using different voices to mention the same thing. We are Christians and we are spirit beings. And God is showing us in a different light. If you want, can, can you just give me two minutes to bow your heads? Maybe there's somebody here right now who wants to say, but, but I want to do what this man said. I want to follow the spirit. I think I'm tired of trying to compete with the world. I'm failing because I don't understand the kind of spirit that they are using. And, 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 and and I'm not going to tell you to stand up. I'm not going to tell you to come forward. This is not what I'm going to do. Upstairs and downstairs. Maybe you're even watching me online. Uh, I'm not going to tell you to stand or come forward. But, but if you've never given your life to Jesus. And you want to make that decision. There's a connection today. There's something that's saying I need to turn around. I need to be like that prodigal son and come back home. Maybe there's something on the inside of you that's saying, I am, I, I now need to fully give my life to Jesus and try, as I was speaking to one guy yesterday, and I said to him, there's a difference between sin and a sinner. We are children of God. We fall down, but we get back up again. That's committing sin. A sinner is someone who does not have any thought about Christ and just continues. It's the difference between me being a doctor and me being helping someone to resuscitate them. The fact that I resuscitated them doesn't mean I'm a doctor. A doctor is a practice. Sinners practice sin. Those who sin fall into it. So you don't have to say I'm a hypocrite. I come to church but you know I still am doing stuff so I don't want to come anymore because that's what Deolu was saying the thought the devil has planted the thought that you've now compared your Christianity to the parameters and the parameters of what the world says or even what the church has said before you are who you are in Christ so if you're just here upstairs downstairs online and you feel this is my time to really come back to Christ 
Just lift your hands. They will put a book in. Don't stand. Don't stand. Just, just wherever you are, just wave at me. Say, Pastor, you know what? He was talking to me. It's me. It's me. It's me. Upstairs or downstairs. Just let me know. Maybe outside in the foyer. Maybe on the stairs. People are sitting there. Maybe by the side. Maybe we will reach all of you. Just wave at me and say, this is, I, I need to give my life to Jesus. Just let me know. Let me know if there's anyone uh, before we close the service. Father, we thank you. And we bless you. If you were not confident enough to lift your hands, but you feel, I wanted to do that, but I just don't trust this guy. He may tell me to stand up. After the service, you see these uh, counselors that are standing around. Walk up to any one of them. Or the ushers, you'll see their badges, you'll see their stuff. And say, you know, I, I, I wanted to do it, but I wasn't too sure. Uh, that some will be upstairs, some will be on the aisle. Just walk up to them and they will help you. We're here to serve you and be a blessing in Jesus' name. Someone says, Amen. Amen. I'm going to get you out right now. Uh, but before we close, why don't we just say into our hearts, we want to give to God this afternoon in giving. Now, I'm going to share this thing and then I'll stop on, 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 on that. Yesterday, I was at the Cornerstone. How many people were at Cornerstone yesterday? Yeah, shout at me. Shout, shout at your boy. <laughs> so I was there. And by the time we were about to finish, something happened that blew my mind. Um, Minister Sean was talking about stewardship and giving and he said, and then he put a picture up it was um, Warren Buffett he put a picture up of Warren Buffett up and he said I, I, I accurately don't know the date so forgive me but it was something like two decades ago or something like that the guy was worth 40 billion dollars 40 billion dollars he said over two decades, I think if I'm right, you understand, I'm not too sure about the, the decade, but over these those years, he had given away 50 billion dollars. So it was 40 billion dollars in assets, but over these two decades or something like that, over a period of time, he gave away 50 billion, but right now he's worth 120 billion. At 40 billion, gave 50 billion but he's still worth 150 billion that's the power of giving not only to church but also to your friends and family just helping someone is in giving anytime you withhold you are stopping your blessing for the future so as you give today, it's give with joy, not out of compulsion. Uh, you may give, um, they'll put the details on online if you want to give online. But if you want to give by an envelope, you want to put cash in there or a check in there, or you want to put your um, um, uh, card details in there, just lift your hands and somebody will put an envelope in your hands and someone lifting up their hands in front here. Uh, someone will just would give it to you. Just lift your hands and they will do that and God will bless you. You don't need to let anybody know what you're doing and it's not by compulsion. But the more you give, the more you've been a blessing. Um, honey, I got out here uh, after the first service. You know, I didn't come upstairs. One lady, young lady just came to me and says, God laid it on her heart to, she just had a new job to give half of her salary. And she was asking me, where do I give it to? A church or what? I said, whatever God, the God that says you should give half, as you heard the word, go further in and ask to who? And she says, oh, to the project in Ghana and stuff. I'm like, you see, you got your answer. Just half of her salary that's coming, God told her to give it to that project in Ghana. For those who give, always prosper. Amen. Are we ready to? Are we, and while you're thinking about what to give, let me invite everyone who's coming to worship Tabernacle for the very first time. If this is your first time in worship Tabernacle, hey, just wave at me. Hey, hey man, God bless you. Oh, God bless you. Thank you so much. There are two of you here. Thank you so much for coming. Anybody else that I've missed? Anybody else who upstairs or downstairs that's coming for the very first time in worship? Thank you so much for coming. May God bless you and keep you and cause his favor to shine upon you. After they say, oh, thank you so much. Oh, my God bless you guys. I saw that bag go. I said, oh, there's someone else there. I saw that bag go. When that purple royalty bag goes, it's purple here. It takes away all the green. Uh, when it manifests. Anyone else upstairs? Did I miss anyone upstairs? Thank you. Oh, th three, four, four. Oh, wow. Come on, church. If you didn't bring someone, clap. <laughs> thank you, all you guys. 
Right now, I know they may have start, used that room as an extension for the service, but they will be preparing that room after the service. We really want to take you upstairs. Uh, if you if you brought a friend to church, please take them upstairs. There's tea, there's coffee, there's biscuits, there's stuff and all that. I want to just be a blessing to you. I'll tell you when to do that. And we so much thank you. If you don't have a church, you're going to come on. Make this church your church. We have two services, 9.30 and 11.30. And it's been such a blessing. So thank you again, guys, for coming. God bless you all. Come and give them a good God bless you. Let's pray over our offering. And after the offering, we close the service. Lift up your offering anywhere you are and make this decree. We do this every single Sunday. It's what God laid on our hearts through, through, through the Bible, through 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, which says what? And God is able to make all grace, every favor, and earthly blessing come to me in abundance. Come on. So that I, yes, may always and under all circumstances, what? Whatever the need be, what? Self-sufficient, what? Possessing enough to require no aid or support. Say, I will be furnished in abundance, what? Unto every good work and charitable donation. If you believe it, shout, yeah! Yeah, amen. You may just go ahead, uh, ushers. If you've got your envelope, just wave. Uh, the ushers will come and pick it up. Can I remind you, we have uh, two services on Wednesday. One at 6 a.m. online. Online, there are people lifting their hands. Darling, come, come, come forward. I need an offering. There's people lifting their hands. There. Uh, you don't, uh, go in the spirit by faith, by faith, by faith. Uh, yes, yes, right in front too. Uh, God bless you as you do that. Um, six o'clock in the morning, we all come online for prayer for 30 minutes. We come on, and then in the evening, we resume again at 7.30. If you, Sundays, there's so many of us, we go back and forward and all that. We're praying to find our own building. We can't, we're, we're even believing God for a building for the 31st to, to, to use. Everybody's saying, we can't, we can't, we can't, we're too many, we're dead. We'll get, we'll get one, don't worry, we'll get one, we'll get one. But, so because of the amount of people on, on what we say to people is you get connected if you join a team. Find a team. By next week, Sunday, they will put up the teams. We're working on the teams and what each team does. You understand? And we'll start to try to put it up every single Sunday so you can pick which one. So there's a way you get into a team that makes you feel family oriented. But also on Wednesdays, I know we're now splitting into two because uh, they're having service downstairs and upstairs too. But it brings another family. You get it smaller and graceful and you have fun and eat some food and all that kind of stuff. Come, I don't want you to be lonely. I don't want you to be lonely in this church. And as we said yesterday, try to say every single Sunday you'll find someone new to get their names and say hello to them and it will just continue to bless you in Jesus name. Amen. We're out of time. Alright, let's stand up. We're going to share the grace. If this is your first time, uh, who's taking them around? If this is your first, come, 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 come forward, come forward. If this is your first time, we want you to pick your bags. If you brought somebody to church, your friend, I want them to go. I don't want them to go alone. So if a friend and family we want to take you upstairs to our lounge because there is a crowd up there and they will, they will really start to, if you want to go after the service, it's not going to walk. Uh, so please uh, go upstairs. We want to really take good care of you, give you some stuff to eat and drink and uh, it will be a blessing in Jesus name. Amen. I'm going to wait for them because if you're not coming for the first time, stay where you are. Where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? If you quickly go home, your team will lose. Just wait. All right. Okay. I'm just waiting for them. I'm waiting. For Come and give them a good God bless you before we all share the grace. Thank you so much. On my online crew, God bless you and keep you and cause his favor to shine upon you. We love you dearly. Uh, if you can come into church anytime, just pop into church. I know some of you live far and some of you have younger children that they may you may not be able to handle. So you'll see it's a season, but we thank you and we bless God for your life. Can we share the grace? Say, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore in Jesus' name. Just look at someone, point at them and say, surely what? Come on, goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life as you dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday, everyone. God bless you. Love you dearly. See you on Wednesday. Those who are in front, just take this way out. There's a, there's a quicker way. There's a good